Time is an enemy for all of us. We must make every moment count. Every minute we must share memories. We've tried to do that on a word on Westerns, and 2021 was a devastating year for those of us who love the genre. We've lost so many of our friends and co-workers. Those people who shared their memories with us on a word on Westerns, we thank them for it. We've created excerpts from some of those interviews of the people that we lost in 2021. They were friends, and we miss them, and we thank them for sharing such great memories. There were also people who were unable to join us on A Word on Westerns, and we've put together tributes to some of them, too. We hope you enjoy these, and we know you'll enjoy watching for years to come the memories that they have left us. Lee Aker is best remembered for the early TV series, The Adventures of Ren 1010, airing from 1954 through 1959 and filmed on the location used for John Ford's Fort Apache. In the long-running hit, Lee starred as Rusty, orphaned in an Indian raid with his German shepherd dog. Both were adopted as mascots to the soldiers of Fort Apache. Born in Los Angeles to a dance instructor mother, Lee had had small parts in High Noon and The Greatest Story Ever Told, both nominated for the Best Picture Oscar in 1952. Lee was the kidnapped boy, Red Chief, in the feature film O. Henry's Full House and was famously taught to swim in 3D by John Wayne in 1953's Hondo. Lee Aker received the Golden Boot Award in 2004. Claudia Barrett co-starred at Republic Pictures with cowboy heroes Monty Hale and Alan Rocky Lane. Some of her TV westerns include Hopalong Cassidy, Cowboy G-Men, The Lone Ranger, Stories of the Century, Cisco Kid, The Roy Rogers Show, Tales of Wells Fargo, three appearances on Death Valley Days, and Shotgun Slade. Perhaps Claudia's biggest claim to fame is her role with former Rustlers on Horseback co-star George Nader. Together, they appeared in the 3D cult disaster, Robot Monster. Singer, songwriter, and musician Ed Bruce wrote the classic country western hit, Mama, Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. As an actor, Bruce was Sheriff Tom Guthrie on Brett Maverick with James Garner and in the TV movies, The Last Days of Frank and Jesse James and Louis L'Amour's Down the Long Hills. Arlene Dahl was a stunningly beautiful actress who starred at MGM with Red Skelton in the 1948 Civil War comedy, A Southern Yankee, and in traditional westerns with Robert Taylor in Ambush and Joel McRae and Claude Jarman Jr. in The Outriders, both 1950. She co-starred with Telly Savalas and George Meharis in the spaghetti western The Land Raiders in 1969. On TV, Arlene guest starred on Riverboat. Married six times, Arlene Dahl appeared in two episodes of Renegade, a series starring her son, Lorenzo Lamas, from her marriage to Fernando Lamas. Lorenzo directed her in both episodes. Henry Darrow stole hearts as Monolito Montoya, the heartthrob of high chaparral. The New York-born actor spent his teenage years in Puerto Rico before training at the Pasadena Playhouse and making the rounds as a guest star on TV westerns including Gunsmoke, Daniel Boone, and Bonanza, produced by David Dortort, who thought Henry would be perfect for his new series, The High Chaparral. He was right. Following that series, Henry won a daytime Emmy for his role on the soap opera Santa Barbara and became the first Latin American actor to portray Zorro on screen in both live action and animated series. One of Hollywood's most successful and popular filmmakers, Richard Donner, began his directing career in 1960 with an episode of Dick Powell's Zane Grey Theater starring Claudette Colbert. Other TV westerns he directed include six episodes of Wanted Dead or Alive, 
seven episodes of The Rifleman, five episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel, Wagon Train, The Tall Man, Cades County, Bearcats, and three episodes of The Wild, Wild West. His non-Western lethal weapon franchise paired him successfully with superstar Mel Gibson and stuntman Mick Rogers. Together they made the 1994 feature film tribute to Maverick with James Garner, Jodie Foster, and a who's who of Western actors. Actor and stuntman Jerry Gatlin was a director's favorite, working multiple times with Henry Hathaway, John Sturgis, Sam Peckinpah, Clint Eastwood, and Burt Kennedy. You've seen him taking hits, having falls, and getting laughs in Have Gun, Will Travel, Catalanian Little Bridges, The Magnificent Seven, Major Dundee, Nevada Smith, Bite the Bullet, Olzana's Raid, Outlaw Josie Wales, and 10 John Wayne Westerns, including The Common Cheros, War Wagon, The Undefeated, Big Jake, Cahill, U.S. Marshal, The Train Robbers, and The Cowboys. Jerry was married three times, once to legendary stunt woman Polly Burson. James Hampton co-starred as the bumbling bugler on the Western sitcom F Troop. He followed that up with the comedy of Camels out west with James Garner in Homps. Non-comedy Westerns included Soldier Blue, The Man Who Loved Cat Dancing, TV roles on Gunsmoke, Rawhide, Death Valley Day, Cimarron Strip, Paradise, Centennial, and a role in Roy Rogers' last starring feature, Macintosh and TJ. Monty Hellman came up through the Roger Corman School of By the Seat of Your Pants Filmmaking. He'd edited The Wild Angels and directed his first film, Beast from the Haunted Cave, for the legendary producer-director. It was working with Corman that Monty hooked up with actor-screenwriter Jack Nicholson to make the low-budget existential westerns The Shooting and Ride the Whirlwind. They were shot back-to-back -back on location in Utah starring Nicholson, Warren Oates, Will Hutchins, and Millie Perkins. Monty's other western was China Nine Liberty 37, again starring Oates and featuring a cameo by another legendary director, Sam Peckinpah. Actor, stuntman, and fight coordinator on Cool Hand Luke, Chuck Hicks probably met Universal contract player Clint Eastwood while both were working on the lot in Francis the Talking Mule movies. Chuck was later beat up by Clint in The Enforcer and Bronco Billy. Chuck was also a past president of the Stuntman's Association of Motion Pictures. Among Chuck's westerns are Horizons West, River of No Return, and Four for Texas. His TV westerns include Cheyenne, Maverick, Gunsmoke, Yancey Derringer, Branded, Daniel Boone, The Big Valley, Iron Horse, and The Virginian. Yafet Koto appeared on Gunsmoke, Death Valley Days, Cowboy in Africa, and two episodes of The Big Valley. Morgan Woodward was the heavy who owned the town where Koto's superior had declared martial law. He also appeared in Bonanza and Man and Boy, and director Steve Carver's Civil War exploitation feature, Drum, in 1976. Cloris Leachman's nine Emmy Awards makes her the recipient of more Emmy Awards than any other actor or actress. She won a Best Supporting Actress Academy Award for her heartbreaking portrayal of a lonely wife of a football coach in The Last Picture Show in 1972. But before earning all the awards, Cloris earlier appeared with Paul Newman in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and worked in most of television's top Western series from the 1950s and 60s, including Dick Powell's Zane Grey Theater, Rawhide, Wanted, Dead or Alive. Outlaws, Gunsmoke, Frontier Circus, Laramie, Wagon Train, Stony Burke, A Man Called Shenandoah, The Big Valley, The Virginian, and Lancer. Larry McMurtry received a Pulitzer Prize for his epic masterpiece, Lonesome Dove, which was turned into a stunning eight-hour miniseries about the American West. The Texas-born author's other novels that were filmed include his first novel, Horseman Pass By, which became HUD on screen. 
The Last Picture Show, Terms of Endearment, Texasville, Streets of Laredo, Dead Man's Walk, Comanche Moon, and The Evening Star. McMurtry co-authored the screenplay for Brokeback Mountain. Trained in New York at the famed Actors Studio, Peter Mark Richmond made his feature film debut in William Wyler's Friendly Persuasion in 1956. His many TV Western appearances include Rawhide, Dick Powell's Zane Grey Theater, The Wild Wild West, Hotel de Paris, Stony Burke, The Loner, Iron Horse, Daniel Boone, Gunsmoke, Lancer, several appearances on The Virginian, and the TV movies Yuma with Clint Walker and Bonanza, The Next Generation. Richmond was also included in the acclaimed book of photographs, Western Portraits, the unsung heroes and villains of the silver screen. Lynn Stallmaster has been called the master caster. Indeed, the legendary casting director's name and the credits ensured that the program would have exciting performances, sometimes by totally unknown actors. Just watch any of the 319 episodes of Gunsmoke that bear his name. He also cast 37 episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel and all of Sam Peckinpah's series, The Westerner. Other Western series he helped cast are The Rifleman, Law of the Plainsman, Sheriff of Cochise, The Texan, Tate, and Kodiak. Western features include Hour of the Gun, Black Patch, The Hallelujah Trail, Monty Walsh, Junior Bonner, The Cowboys, Return of the Seven, and Valdez is Coming. Former child actor Dean Stockwell grew up on camera. As a contract player at MGM from the age of 12, Dean earned his spurs with Western icon Joel McRae in 1950's Stars in My Crown. Young co-star Stockwell also narrated the heartwarming film that dealt with his uncle, a two-gun carrying minister. McRae, of course. That very next year, Stockwell was reunited with McRae as the spoiled son of a railroad magnate in Cattle Drive. His TV westerns include The Outlaws, Bonanza, Cimarron City, multiple episodes of Wagon Train, Son of Morningstar, Kenny Rogers' The Gambler, Part 3, and as Billy the Kid in Dennis Hopper's 1971 feature film, The Last Movie. Longtime double and stunt coordinator for Clint Eastwood, Buddy Van Horn earlier worked behind the scenes as a stuntman on dozens of feature westerns. He worked as a stuntman on Destry, Ride Clear of Diablo, Gunsmoke, all with Audie Murphy before becoming one of Guy Williams' stunt doubles on Disney's Zorro TV series and William Smith's on TV's Laredo. Some of Buddy's other major westerns are Alvarez Kelly, Fire Creek, Bandolero, Major Dundee, The Stalking Moon, The Cowboys, Big Jake, and All the Pretty Horses. He first worked for and doubled Clint Eastwood on Coogan's Bluff, which led to a lot of very exciting movies and a long friendship with the actor-director. The westerns they made together are Paint Your Wagon, Two Mules for Sister Sarah, Joe Kidd, High Plains Drifter, Pale Rider, but he directed Eastwood in three non-westerns, Any Which Way You Can, The Deadpool, and Pink Cadillac. I started working with certain actors that I just look at them and they knew exactly what was wrong with the take or, or what they should be doing. And I mean, it's, it's sort of like sign language and you create that, that um, you know, that, that relationship, that connection. And it's so easy. When you work with somebody that you don't know, you have to go through a lot of um, political stuff, diplomatic stuff, and, and, and you literally get a, uh, a feeling that if you don't prove yourself, you don't get respected on the set, you don't get anything. I mean, you get work, but you don't get special stuff. Mm -hmm. And I found out that, that by hiring a certain character actors that, that really had a love for what they were doing, over and over again, you, you get better work. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my pictures were successful because of that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you're working on something right now where you're taking some of these great character actors and putting together a coffee table photo book. You started your yes. career out of college as a photographer. Yes. Uh, good. Uh, tell us about the book. Well, the book is called Unsung Heroes and Villains of the Silver Screen. And they're, the photographs that I'm doing are reminiscent of uh, pictures that were made 150 years ago. I use the process, uh, a film negative process, uh, and a time exposure. Uh, Morgan can tell you about it because he sat in one. And um, it's a very special image that comes to light. Um, it's not a snapshot. It has nothing to do with digital work. Uh, the lighting, the sets, everything that's involved is, is all analog and all old-fashioned or, or whatever you want to call it, similar to, to making movies, making movies the way that I used to make movies. I mean, it's a little different now, but um, I don't know, it, it, it's hard to explain, but something special comes to light. The characters that, that when they sit, come through. It, it, it's almost as if the camera picks up and captures something very special. And this is a book that I've been working on for over 20 years. The Sodbusters, what do you remember about working on that show? Well, I remember everything about it because first of all, it was a great script. And it was based on, I think, provoked by the movie Shane. So the character that I played was very much like the character of Shane, the retired gunfighter who's trying to become anonymous and uh, helping out a family of ranchers. And here I was the star of that episode. And there's a scene in a bar where three young punk cowboys come in there and they've already had a little something to drink and all they want is trouble and they know who I am. So their whole deal is to provoke me to try to get me to make a move toward them or something, especially with a gun. Uh, and at one point, one of the guys has one or two little provocative lines toward me and he makes a move of some sort that warranted my punching him and knocking him clean over the bar. It was Harrison Ford. <laughs> How the world turns. <laughs> I mean, would anybody, would I ever have been able to come away from that and predict this guy's going to be a big star? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was a little extra guy, you know, and so that's one of my great memories, punching Harrison Ford over a bar. Jimmy was a really, he was a good kid. Of course, I was mother of, I, my, my kids were a six, four, and two. And a lot of times, Jimmy would act like a little kid. I said, okay, son. You're going to act like a two or three year old, I'm going to treat you like one. Because I didn't put up any guff for anybody. And I, I liked him a lot. But there were a lot of things that I felt like Jimmy had really very sincerely missed in, in his life. And I hoped to get to know him better. And every, I took, when I went on location, I took 150 books, Monopoly games, we had playing cards, we had a croquet set. We did all kinds of things. The crew named my house Withers USO. <laughs> and, and every night after we'd finished work, everybody come to my house, and I had two or three friends in Texas that had their own private jets, so they'd fly to El Peso, it's the only place we could get deli food, so we'd have deli food and just, I'd never let them have beer, nothing but one glass of beer, that's it, no booze, and they had to leave at 10 o'clock at night. Everybody would come, and we all, we all worked and played together that night. You know, we did all kinds of things. It was wonderful, and played good music. Now, I'm cleaning up after everybody leaves, and I go in the back bedroom and sitting on the, one of the twin beds with his feet up on the, on the end of the, of, the, uh, of the bed, and with his hand, how cowboy hat down over his eyes, I said, Dear Gussie, who is that? And he said, It's me. He never moved an inch. It's me with a hat down over his head. I said, Jimmy, is that you? 
Why didn't you come through the front door, for goodness sakes? He said, I didn't want to see all those people. I came to talk to you. I said, well, that's very nice, but would you be kind enough to come to the front door next time? He said, we'll see. And I said, we certainly will. <laughs> he didn't know that I carried my own toolkit everywhere I ever went. So I had my hammer and nails. I got them out. And I took them to the back bedroom. I started hammering down the, the windows. He said, what are you doing? I said, what does it look like? Now uh, you'll have to come through the front door. I was going along with Jimmy Kahn, and we, uh, we bump into Duke sitting there. And uh, I, being a big liberal, uh, stayed away from talking anything about liberal to John Wayne. But uh, Jimmy Kahn said, uh, so uh, what happened with you and uh, the patent movie? Duke began to talking about it, and he got so angry because they wouldn't do patent the way he wanted it to be done, so that eventually they got George C. Scott to do it. Jimmy kept thrusting him these questions, which just provoked him all the more. You know? <laughs> and he just kept getting in, and he had his hat in his hand, he had his hat in his hand, and he began talking about it, and talking about the guys involved in the movie, and he got... So angry, he kept whipping his his leg with his hat, you know. Damn it, son of a bitch. I was amazed he had a hat left. That was, but but well, Jimmy, Jimmy just kept. He was a, oh, he was good. Dad, it's, we know that. It's great to see you again after all this time, and uh, you've had such great success. I appreciate you coming here to talk about John Wayne and your Westerns. It means a lot to us here. Thank you. He was uh, the consummate professionally. He always knew his, his lines. He was prepared to go. He was in good humor. Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was an outstanding guy. And, and we became friends. Mm -hmm. Did you go motorcycle riding with him? Yeah, I, yeah, I did. And uh, an interesting story was in the uh, in the second season, he would ride that motorcycle and he'd come into the lot, you know, on the on the rear wheel and stuff like that. <laughs> and my dad was concerned that uh, he would uh, uh, he would hurt himself and you know to shut the show down. So in in the second in the second year. They wrote it into his con contract that he couldn't ride the motorcycle during there. Yeah. Now, I, I didn't know that. And he and I would talk and what have you, and he had a, a Triumph Bonneville. And he said to me, you know, I could sell this to you at a very, very good price, this <laughs> motorcycle. And I said, what? And he, and he offered a price that I couldn't refuse. <laughs> and I, I bought it. <laughs> The humor of him selling his motorcycle he could run to the boss's son. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Some photographers were there, and, and I got next to him, and I and, and, uh, was getting up my shot with John Wayne. And so while we're standing there, I'm smiling, and, uh, and at, at this time I thought it was appropriate to smile. And, and, then, and then I felt like I should say something. So I started to say, well, it's been a real on before I can get any further than that. <clears throat> you know, he didn't want to hear that again because I'm sure every actor that ever worked with him tried to say that, and he had heard it enough. A few nights ago, I saw a film called Westward the Women. That's a terrific movie. But I did notice that it didn't have a title song. So if you'll bear with us, we're going to premiere the title song. <clears throat> Civilization call Westward the women It's a calling on us all So good and true A man just cannot do it all alone So ain't no wives to the promised land Westward, westward Westward the women Westward, westward Westward the women A journey fraught with danger Hardship and with woe Awaited any woman Strong and brave enough to go Believing was the key And each good woman knew That she had found her destiny So oh, westward the, the women Hear civilization Ooh. call Westward the, the women It's a calling on us all For good and true Ooh. A man just cannot do it all alone Promised land and westward, 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 westward the women, westward, westward, westward the women. From wilderness, a town was forged, far off western land, with muscle, sweat, nerves of steel. Men built it all by hand, then to bring it life. With Providence's blessing, each good man would find a wife. So westward the women, new civilization call. Westward the women, it's a calling on us all. Although good and true, a man just cannot do it all alone. So ain't those wives to the promised land. And westward, westward, westward the women. Westward, westward. Westward, 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 the women. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. The Swallow Sisters. And Mr. Will Ryan. Well, so many people wrote to me and asked me when I would be able to get Bill on a word on Westerns. And unfortunately, I, I started it a little bit too late for yeah. Bill. Can you explain to people how you were protecting him? Well, um, uh, sadly, Bill came down with dementia, the Alzheimer's form. And um, so we, you know, at, some, at a point, we stayed out of the limelight. You know, we moved away from the big city and... Uh, lived in a nice, quiet town called Camarillo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I remember at, at some of the book signings, as his dementia was, be, people were be, who knew him were becoming aware of that, yes. and you were always there at yes. his side. Yes, yes. At, uh, he was, had that poetry book. Yes. Yeah, he probably was sick of me at that point, being by his side, but I wasn't leaving. <laughs> no, that was great, yeah. though, to, yeah. To be there. You were his angel, I always told people. Oh, thank you. He was a magnificent legend in the business. Yes. Worked with so many people. How many shows did he do? Um, well, I think title-wise, three at least 300. But if you count, you know, like he did a year of Hawaii Five-0, a couple of years of uh, Laredo, if you count the episodes, much more. Mm-hmm. Everyone comes up to me, has been coming up to me and giving me their condolences, which I greatly appreciate. Um, but I didn't, I didn't look at Bill's passing as a sad event. 
Um, he lived a wonderful life. He accomplished more than most people do in three lifetimes. And um, he, he died happ with a smile on his face, with the, those that loved him, was with him. And I know that, I know down the road, I'm going to see him again. So it's just a temporary um, separation. Well, you mentioned the older actors who were involved in that show, but what was interesting, looking back at them now, yeah. is the, the group of young people that were coming up who guest starred in them. Oh, I know yeah. uh, Jack Lord and Warren Oates and uh, Robert Culp, all these uh, terrific actors uh, were guest stars and bad guys in your oh, show. Oh, yeah. Uh, who was the guy on uh, Star Trek? William Shatner. Bill Shatner, yeah. He, he did two of our shows back in those days. Mm -hmm. Shatner couldn't ride very well, but he was game for anything. And we had a we had a shot one day where me and Slim got the bad guys with guns on them. We're holding them for this sheriff coming in from out of town, and the camera's on top of a building, and it's going to catch the sheriff is is Bill Shatner, and the camera's going to catch Bill riding in from this end of the street all the way to where we are over here with the bad guys. And the camera's up high, and the director's, now Billy says, come on in fast. He says, he says, you want this bad guy they've got, and you want to get him real quick. So the camera's up there, me and Slim are down there with the bad guys, and he says, action, and here come old Bill. I mean, he's, he's balls out across there, just giving it hell, all he could do, you know. And uh, he got pretty close to it, he's still going fast. And he, he throws his foot off, and, and his other foot got hung up, and he landed on the ground like this, and he's sliding, and as he slid, he pulled out his gun, and he got up where he says, okay, I'll take him from here, boys. 